from New Jersey. Right. Jimmy, I'm a recovering addict. I want to thank God for everything. Truly clean to His grace and His mercy. And the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, but before we get started, I would like to do something, if you could um, indulge me. I'd, I'd like to uh, take a moment of silence and uh, invite my God in and have you invite your God in. And then when it's all said and done, God will get the praise and we'll just reap the benefits. So if we could do that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I want to uh, thank the greater LA area for uh, extending such a gracious uh, welcome and inviting me out to do, um, you know, no pressure, right? It just says the spiritual closing meeting. <laughs> like no pressure. Uh, spiritual, being of the, the body and the spirit, being of the the uh, extra natural being and the word spiritual in the dictionary talks about enhancement of the spirit and you know sometimes we get caught up in what spiritual is and what religious is and what moral is and all of those things and I, I'm not here today to um, try to indulge or enforce my, my moral beliefs on anybody in here this morning I've just been invited to share my experience strength and hope and my message is not my message, it's God's message, and it's the message that an addict, any addict, can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. That's what our message is. And, and, and the, the young lady who's doing the sign language asked me if I could slow down a little bit. <laughs> and she asked me that before I started sharing. So, you know, I'm from the East Coast, and we talk a little bit quicker <laughs> than you folks from the West Coast. And because in the, in the basic text and in introduction, it says that everything we do should be motivated to more successfully carry the message of recovery to the addict that still suffers, right? Everything we do. So I will try to oblige the young lady and slow down a little bit. However, <laughs> once the spirits hit, I got no choice. You know, I've been blessed to be a lot of places in, in the period of time that I've been clean, but it seems like every time I come back to California, the love and the respect that I receive from you people is just so overwhelming. And, and, and I, I want to tell you why that is so, so different for me, because, see, most folks out here have the clean time that I'm alive. I want you to understand something. Where I come from, I am not one of the people who is respected based on the fact that I've been clean for over 12 years and I'm a 12-step member and I happen to have some experience that some folks just don't seem to believe that I have because possibly, just possibly, they didn't work any steps when they first got here. <laughs> And possibly, just possibly, they had no traditions in their life when they first got here. So as opposed to trying to help me to shine brighter, they want to dim the light of God within me. See, I don't want you to get it confused. There are blessing blockers right here in Narcotics Anonymous. See, I'm the underdog type of addict. I'm the underdog type of addict. I'm the, I'm the addict that loves the addict that comes to Narcotics Anonymous, right? Not that suffers, but has a hard time getting clean. 
And what I'm talking about, right, is I'm talking about I came to Narcotics Anonymous in 1986, but my clean date is May 1st, 1992. For six years, I came to meetings, five, six, 12, 14 meetings a week, and still used. I was the addict who had a hard time surrendering to the fact that I could no longer associate with people, places, and things while I was trying to stay clean because they would get me high before I would get them clean. I'm talking about I struggled to stay clean for a lot of years, so when I see the addict come to meetings that smells and funky and slimy and greasy and don't look like they got nothing, I want them to understand that maybe in the year 2009, they just might be the closing speaker at Glackner 9. I want them to understand that our goal and purpose in life is to flame, fl fan the flame of desire that lies within them. Because if an addict is in a Narcotics Anonymous meeting and under the influence of a substance, they are showing a courage not their own. We need to fan the flame. Don't push the joker away that smells. Embrace them. Bring them in. Show them the love that they're here to be shown. That's what our purpose is. We're talking about spiritual in nature. I'm talking about like being in a position where you can take the underdog and make him the overdog. I remember getting clean on May 1st, 1992. I remember going to a meeting in the area in which I live. I can remember getting a white key tag and I can remember the addicts making statements like, why is he getting another white key tag? That boy is never gonna stay clean. Why is he wasting our time? Why is he doing this? What's he doing here? He ain't never gonna get clean. He'll never change. He doesn't have what it takes. Well, if they could only see me now. So now I'm loose. <laughs> now I can have fun, Tyrone. I want to talk, I want to, I want to tell y'all that I got an NA sponsor who 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 got an NA sponsor. I'm tied into the young man who stood up last night for 43 years. I know where my direction comes from. And I don't say that to separate myself from anybody who might not have a Narcotics Anonymous sponsor, but I believe that a requirement as according to IP number two is that the speaker carry a clear Narcotics Anonymous message and I find it hard for an addict to carry a clear Narcotics Anonymous message if they don't have a Narcotics Anonymous sponsor. But that's just what I find, you find your own stuff. I got a Narcotics Anonymous home group. It meets on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. 4th and Walnut, Roselle, New Jersey. It's a basic text meeting. We do uh, chapter one to chapter 10. We also understand that not everybody believes and is into the literature. So in the beginning, in the back room on the right-hand side is a beginner speaker meeting for the addicts who have yet decided to endeavor into the recovery process. Yeah, I said it. Because I, I ain't, God got my back. <laughs> Hey, there, there ain't no weapon formed against me that God can't conquer. There ain't nothing y'all could do to me that God's not greater than. So I'm crystal clear on the fact that God brought me here. God got my back. So if y'all don't like me, that's all right. Call your sponsor. <laughs> And that's not an arrogant statement. Self-righteousness in the sixth step says strong, confident belief in oneself. I'm not arrogant. I have confident belief in what God has done in my life, not your life. I'm not worried about your life. I'm only worried about my life. So what I'm talking about, right, is I got an NA sponsor. I got an NA home group. I'm a 12-step member. I've been through the traditions, and I have one woman in my life. Because one's too many and a thousand's never enough. <laughs> but I want to go. 
I want to just ride. I just want to ride on what Tyrone was talking about last night. I'm going to just take you in a direction just a slight different than what Tyrone did last night. Listen, I'm into hip hop. I listen to hip hop. That's my thing. Um, me and Eminem and Nelly and 50 Cent. But there's a new hit out, right? Akon got a new, a new joint out called Locked Up. And if you listen to the words of Locked Up, it talks about what are your motives. It talks about all my family wants is for me to do better. What I want to talk about is being up in this camp and being locked up with clean time. Being locked up with 12 steps in your life. Being locked up, not being able, no, check this, not being willing to do what's necessary to get from where you're at to where you want to go. Being here for some time, having a good relationship, having kids, having two cars, having a house, having a good job, having the respect of the NA community, but yet, and still yet, in whatever position you might be in, not having the ability on any level to look at yourself in the mirror and have complete self-acceptance of exactly who you are. I'm talking about being locked up in Narcotics Anonymous, allowing your clean time or your sharing at the podium to hold you hostage to an image of which you are not. <laughs> allowing people to put you in a spot in which you just don't belong. I'm an addict, man. I used. I've been clean for a minute. Big deal. Ask my folks, they think I should be clean for 38 years. <laughs> you know, that, that state thing, they think is, man, boy, boy you should have never used. <laughs> boy, you should have never used. You shouldn't have 12 years, you should have 38. <laughs> so in my family's eyes, I'm about 26 years short. <laughs> But my daughter, my oldest daughter, just said to me, we were sitting there doing the reads, and my oldest daughter just said, hey, Daddy, does, does it cost anything to come to N.A.? <laughs> you know, and, and I leaned over to him, I said, no, baby, it's free. And then I said, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> I said, well, baby, it costs it cost, um, to come to the convention because we got to pay for the hotel and we got to do those types of things. I said, but baby, N.A. is not free either. We pay a great price, right? Basic text says that we paid, um, we paid for the seat we sit in with great pain. And I paid with great pain to get the seat in Narcotics Anonymous, but it's a gift from God and it's my objective to maintain his gift. You know, many of us come in here and we think we could just stop using and make meetings and we'd be straight. But the disease of addiction goes way further than drugs. Drugs in the first step, and it works how and why, says, are just the most obvious symptom of the disease of addiction. Right? Who's an addict says, many of us come to believe that long before we ever used, the disease of addiction was apparent in our lives. So if the disease of addiction was apparent long before I ever used, what makes me think a couple days of being clean is going to absolve me of a dilemma I had before I ever used? So what I'm talking about is suffering with a spiritual dilemma. I'm talking about suffering spiritually, being bankrupt spiritually from way back. I'm talking about being sent to church and doing the catechism. I was listening, being an altar boy, drinking the wine and, you know, standing there as an altar boy and like being up in church every week and every Sunday for an hour and a half and being up in there and hearing stuff like God was going to punish me if I did this and my tongue was going to turn black if I did that and you was going to do this and that was going to happen. And I remember like being forced and a God being put into my life, but not being open to the God that was being put in my life because it wasn't a God of my choice. It was a God of my parents' choice, and if I really take a real good look, my parents did not obey or serve that God that they were telling me to go obey and serve. So what I'm talking about is don't tell your kids about God, show your kids about God. <laughs> 11 step and it works how in the step working God talks about we might need to go outside Narcotics Anonymous to get a spiritual path. So what I'm suggesting is that if that's what you're doing, don't send your kids to your place of worship. Take your kids to your place of worship. You can't tell me what to do. You need to show me what to do. So what I'm talking about is way back, a little boy, five years old, hair parted on the side. I had him. 
Back in the day, I had long hair, right? Loop into my house, I had long hair, man. <laughs> hair parted to the side, little corny bow tie, collared shirt, uh, corduroy jeans, Sears and Roebuck shoes. <laughs> corny as the day was long. Always had my books with me. Teacher asked a question, I knew it. If I read it, if I read it three months later, I still knew what it said. But that wasn't cool. You know, the fellas didn't think that was cool. The fellas were like, you corny boy. <laughs> Teacher's pet, mama's boy, sissy, bookworm, corny. You know, and I didn't want to be corny, I wanted to be down. So I remember as a young boy, trying to change my perception and my reality as which it was. And I remember way back, I remember my mom telling me, baby, you just got, just go to God and God will be all right. But God wasn't enough for me at that time. No matter how much I went to those places and tried to find that God and do the things that I was being directed to do, I still hated myself on the inside. I've hated myself all my life. I never measured up to the people in the neighborhood all my life. I was always shorter than everybody else. I had freckles. I was a white boy growing up in the projects in Jersey City, New Jersey. So you know I really didn't fit in. You know, I wasn't light-skinned. Y'all laugh, but you know, you just want to be down. And when you're the only white family in the projects, you just want to be down. So whatever it takes to be down, you want to be, you know, yeah, he, you know. He just her boy, and you know, he just lights, nah, that wasn't my story. I had freckles and straight hair, and you know, I just didn't fit in. I don't know if y'all understand what I'm talking about, but being in an environment in which you just don't adapt too well and you don't fit in, so doing whatever it takes to just fit in and like just trying to be down because you just want to be accepted because you hate yourself and your mom and your pops are caught up in doing whatever they're doing, so you're really not being accepted by them, so you're going to try to find acceptance any place you can get it. So what I found out at an early age is if I just did what you wanted me to do and you would hang out with me, then I felt like I was accepted, so I was willing to sell myself soul just so you would be my friend so I didn't have to be alone because I didn't want to have to be alone because I hated myself. I, don't, oh, I guess y'all can't identify. <laughs> I guess y'all can't identify with self-hatred on a level so deep that you're willing to sell your soul. Well, I need to tell you, I brought that to Narcotics Anonymous with me. I used for years and years and years and years and years trying to cover up that hatred. And then I came to Narcotics Anonymous. I remember my, those six years trying to be clean, man, trying to get clean. I was just trying to do whatever y'all told me to do, man. Just go hang out with them folks. So people, listen, I'm going to share it, right? We, Pam and I talked about it before. I'm going to talk about it. People would say, boy, you, you know, you, you got to go to the white meetings. <laughs> now, I talk about this stuff. This is my story. This is my experience. Boy, you, boy, you got to go to the white meetings. Why are you always in all the black meetings? I thought it was an NA meeting. Like, it didn't say the white N.A. meeting in the front. <laughs> I looked in the meeting directory and said, step meeting, Narcotics Anonymous, not white step meeting. I guess we got a set of steps for the white folks and the Mexicans and the blacks and the, and the gays and the straights and the don't know what they are. We must have a whole bunch of set of steps up in this camp. But I remember people saying, I remember, y'all are laughing, man, but I was so influential when I got, tried to get clean, man. I just went wherever they said. And I remember meeting this joker and I had, I was in treatment. And, and, and I, he came in, he had a raccoon hat, a sheepskin coat, Lee jeans, sewn in seam, shell top Adidas with the fat laces. He dipped when he walked. I wasn't sure if he was Run or D from Run DMC. And anybody that knows my first sponsor knows he looks just like Dow McDaniels. I mean, like to a T, he looks like him. So I, you know, I thought maybe I said, man, damn, DMC's in recovery. <laughs> but he had this bad girl with him. She was holding plus. <laughs> now I'm engaged now. I'm engaged, right? But I wasn't interested in my fiance. <laughs> 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 
All I heard for four weeks when this brother came up was, if you want what we got, do what we do. I didn't hear him say nothing else for four weeks. And I said, oh my God, I could get me one of them. I can get me, I can get me. <laughs> now, I had me one of them at home, but you know the grass is always green on the other side. You know, and my wife's a, a, a non-addict, so like, you know, I was like, well, this girl must be in recovery, so you know, we could probably, you know, get it, you know, probably get it together here, and you know, she could understand me, I could understand her, and you know. I never seen her after the four weeks, I couldn't even tell you what her name was. I was mesmerized. I was 20 years old. I had been with my wife for five years at that time. And uh, I came out and I used, man. And, and I remember being back in treatment in, in uh, August of 1992. And uh, I'm in a meeting in Matawan, New Jersey, and I'm in the back. I got 37, 38 days clean, and I want to smoke real hard. I can taste it, I can smell it. I got a furlough coming up that weekend. I'm going home. I got money in my pocket and my wife's starting to trust me a little something, something. And I'm figuring I can tell I'm going to a meeting, I'm gonna go get high. And I'm in the back of the room and I wanna use so bad, so bad. And this brother raises his hand and he says, listen, I'm so-and-so, I'm an addict, I'm, uh, you know, I'm clean six years, but I'm in multiple relationships, but I know through sponsorship, God and the sixth step, I don't never have to live like this again. And I was like, oh my God, how could he share that in a meeting? Because I wanted to get high and couldn't tell nobody. I couldn't even tell Tyrone on the side, much less in a meeting. And I went up to this brother after the meeting and I said, hey, listen. And when he turned around, it was the same brother from six years earlier. And he had a sweatshirt on, a pair of lean jeans, and a pair of Tims. He was completely different than the man I had met six years earlier. I had seen Narcotics Anonymous in action. And I looked at him and I said, hey, um, would you sponsor me? He kind of dropped his head. And, Probably went into prayer and he looked up at me and he said, <laughs> he, said he said, boy, I would, I would be honored to help you. And that man, that man created what stands before you. He was a black man from Harlem who shot dope. He had no job, obviously no particular girl. <laughs> he slept on a foam couch in Matawan, New Jersey. And here I was, white boy from Jersey who smoked crack. I had a wife, I had a job, I had a trade, I had a driver's license. So if you looked on the outside, you would think he would want me to sponsor him. But spiritually, he was so in touch with his God. And I could see this thing around him. I don't know if you're gonna, I'm not talking the religious thing, but I could just see it and feel an aura around him. And I just wanted what he had. And that man just loved me right where I was. No matter what I said, no matter what I did, he just said, Jimmy, just go to the steps, Jimmy, just work the steps. And I was like, can we do the suggested readings? He said, boy, you can't do, you too sick for the suggested reading. <laughs> I said, well, 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 then what are we gonna do? He said, boy, you gonna work the steps. I said, hold, time out. Can I get six months? He said, obviously not without the steps. <laughs> I said, can I get my life together? He said, definitely not without the steps. <laughs> so my thing was like, well, you know, what makes you think the steps are gonna work? He said, he said, you know, I know you know that literature already. He says, open your book to page 19, last paragraph before the first step starts, where it says that the steps are a solution, now it defense against addiction, which is a deadly disease. They are the principles that make our recovery possible. Recovery and relapse in italics on the second page says that our goal is recovery through the 12 steps, not mere abstinence. He said, boy, you're too sick, you need to get better. So I said, well, hold on, man, hold on. Can we wait like six months, a year? I gotta write right away? He said, yeah, you gotta write right away. He said, Jimmy, if you go to the doctor, you tell the doctor what your symptoms are. Tell the doctor you're coughing and you're sneezing and you can't breathe. When he gives you the antidote to your symptoms, does he tell you to wait six months? 
Or does he tell you to take your now behind to the prescription to the to the pharmacy, get the prescription filled, and start getting better right now? He said, read how it works. It says the sooner we face our problems, the sooner we face our problems. You know, addicts want to come around here and just stop using and think, you know, can't understand why they can't keep a job. Relationships are going out the out the window. They buying everything at the store. Ain't paying no rent, they're at every convention. <laughs> Talking about, well, but, 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 I, but I got three years now. But boy, you homeless. Boy, you're sleeping in the Y. Yeah, you got six pair of gators, but you're sleeping in the Y. Yeah, that's a fat ride you got, but you're sleeping in the Y, boy. You know, now I hear other people talk about, well, you know, I, I used in the ghetto, I got clean in the ghetto, I stayed in the ghetto. Narcotics Anonymous tells me to come on up. Thank you. Narcotics Anonymous said, find a new way to live. For me, staying, right, in the projects in the ghetto would not be finding a new way to live. I can't speak for nobody in here, but when I'm around negativity, I live in negativity. I can't afford to have myself in the, in the depths of destruction. I'm not spiritually strong enough to be able to pull myself out of the depths of destruction when it's completely around me. So what I needed to do is I need to surround myself with spiritually sound people. People who are living right, who are acting right. People say stuff like, boy, you think you're better than. I don't think I'm better than. I have complete self-acceptance and understanding that if I hang out with single men, I'm going to want to do what single men do. <laughs> My first 18 months, I went to meetings in the go-go bar every single night. Every, I was with, I was with, I'm working steps on the seventh step. I'm on a seventh step. My mom said, what'd you do last night after the meeting, boy? I said, me and so-and-so and so-and-so went to, you know, Cinderella's. He said, boy, you went to Cinderella's? I said, yes, mom. He said, what you doing this, boy, what you doing? Man, where's your first step? Are you violating your first step? I said, no, I ain't used. He said, you are in the element of the disease. I said, well, I don't understand that. He said, boy, when you go there, you get outside yourself, right? I said, yeah. He said, you give these girls all your money, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, boy, and then what you do? I said, well, I go home and try to wake my wife up. He said, what happens when she don't want to get up? I get a resentment. He said, you don't see the disease of addiction, Jimmy? He says, you can't involve yourself in stuff that's unspiritual. You don't have, and I'm not talking about nobody else in here. Y'all do whatever y'all want to do. I'm talking about me. I'm not the addict that can do unspiritual things and be okay. Shame and guilt destroy me. Shame and guilt destroy my spirit. I'm not the addict that can come up in here and be in multiple relationships and be cheating on my wife and doing all, I don't have that luxury. I'm talking about, I'm the type of addict that even at a convention like this, I'll be with my wife and if a bad girl walks by and I look at her, I feel bad. I know a lot of men in this room can't buy that, but I'm telling you that that's just who I am. I'm talking about like when a woman walks by and I'll be holding my wife's hand and be going, oh my God. <laughs> For me, just for me, that's disrespectful to my wife. Matter of fact, what I'm doing, as a matter of fact, what I'm doing is I'm teaching my daughters that that's an acceptable behavior. I'm talking about like I don't need my daughters to believe for a minute that any man should mistreat them. I work diligently and not miss. My wife's sitting there, y'all can go ask her. I don't mistreat my wife. Sometimes I'm sharp with the tongue. But I don't mistreat my wife. I don't put my hands on her. I don't mistreat her. I don't call her out of her name. I don't do those things because I want my daughters to understand that they deserve better. So I'm not the addict that can afford the luxury of those types of things. I'm talking about, like, listen, man, I remember six months clean calling my sponsor, talking about, I'm out, man, I'm out. He said, you out? Where do you think you're going? I said, I'm out of here. Now, I spent three months in treatment, right? She paid for it. 
pay the car notes, pay the rent, and pay for me to be in treatment. So I'm home three months now, and I'm tired of her. <laughs> she holding me back. She will not allow me to reach my full potential, sponsor. <laughs> Boy, did you fall and bump your head? <laughs> now, we celebrate the Christmas holiday, and it was Christmas Eve when I called him. So he suggested that I wait until I do the fourth step, until, you know, I make a decision like that. He said, because, Jimmy, you're still dealing with the drugs. We got to get to the exact nature in four and five before you can make a decision like that. He said, that's what I suggest. So I hung up the phone. We exchanged Christmas gifts uh, on Christmas Eve, because that's just what her and I do. And she gave me a pregnancy test. She was pregnant with our oldest daughter. And I made a nine month commitment that I would stay with her through the pregnancy, but then I was out of there. Yeah. <laughs> but see, when you're working steps, you, you rescind your permission to God. When you surrender in the first and the third and the sixth step, God no longer needs your permission to change the condition of your heart. So what happened in the nine months time was I fell totally in love with my wife. Mm. Completely and entirely in love with my wife. We've been married over 15 years now. We've been together over 23 years. I've never been outside my relationship with my wife. But I want to clarify something. I'm not committed to my wife. I stood before God. I said before God, no matter what, to hell or high water, I would be by her side. So I don't not cheat on my wife. I don't not cheat on God. My commitment is to my relationship with the God of my understanding. So if I go outside my marriage, I'm not going to hurt my wife as much as I'm going to hurt my relationship with God. Contrary to popular belief, I could make it through immense pain without my wife, but I will never make it through life without God. And all my, all my credit goes to the God of my understanding because we've been through 14 months, 9 months, 11 months, 17 months, 22 months, 8 months, 5 months, where there's been no sexual intercourse in my household through my wife being sick. See, so, you know, I hear a lot of stuff, like, I got needs. <laughs> I know I ain't gonna be popular when I'm done, but that's all right. I didn't come here to be popular. I come here to share my experience, strength, and hope. I got needs. Nah, boy, you got wants. And you impatient with God. You impatient with God. You just ain't willing to allow God to run your life. You have not surrendered in the first and the third step yet. You still think you're in charge of something. And I say that, man, because trust me. Trust me, the disease, it's cunning. You know, because my thing is, I like a fat ass and a pretty smile. And you know, every time my wife gets sick or, you know, she goes through a little something, be telling me no, you know what God sends? A fat ass and a pretty smile. I'll be on a road trip somewhere, right? And I'll share, you know, and, and, and my flavor, the one I said I would cheat on my wife with, comes up to me and says, how you doing? <laughs> Can we talk? I was in Atlanta like four or five years ago. My wife was with me. And I finished sharing. I came down off the podium. And this girl was like a 22 plus. I was like, oh my God. I watched it from the back door. Like, yeah, thank you. My wife was standing right next to me. She rolled right up on me. She said, hi, baby. 
how you doing? You know you the man. I really need to talk to you. My room number is such and such and such and such. I said, well, thank you for sharing. Did you meet my wife? <laughs> See, I don't, I don't pull them. My wife knows. She knows how powerful a disease of addiction is. See, the disease doesn't want me to use. It surrendered to the fact that it can't get me to use a narcotic to take away my clean time. So what the disease does is it becomes covert. It becomes covert. It starts dressing itself up in the things I think I want. It starts sending me things I think I need. It starts telling me stuff like, you know, she would probably be a lot nicer than your wife. You know, she, you, know, I heard, you heard stories about her now. You know, you could probably get all you want. You know, you could probably have this. Or I'll be out somewhere and I'll, you know, I'm into hip hop and I got a stereo system in my, and I'll hear a better system than mine and have a couple dollars in my pocket. Now I'm at the store talking about, oh man, I can get me another stereo. I call Lou from Boston, he'll come down and hook me up with some TVs. I can do this. What I'm talking about is escaping my own reality. And, and what is, why are we here says that through our inability to accept personal responsibilities, we're actually creating our own problems. So I'm talking about how the disease becomes covert and it attacks in manners in which I've never been attacked before. So what I'm talking about is like, when I'm, I'm going in a whole other direction, I'm talking about insecurities. I want to talk about insecurities. I want to talk about being with the same woman for 23 years, right? Knowing, knowing in my heart that my wife's never been with anybody but me. Knowing that my wife's personality and belief system is that you don't do those types of things. However, about eight months ago, we were at my house with some young lady who comes over the house and has kind of adopted my wife and I, myself as her surrogate parents because her parents are divorced and it's not a happy thing and she's like 17 years old and she was at my house and we were just talking one night and you know, I thought I had dealt with some stuff in four and five over a, a, an alleged relationship that my wife had. You know, it was a made up marriage that she was supposed to get married to this joker that lived next door to her. You know, and it never happened because I asked her out first and blah, 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 and the whole nine. But, you know, all my life I've lived in insecurities and believing that she only married me out of pity and she didn't marry me out of love and that she really wanted to be with this joker. So we're at, the, at my house and it's like 9 o'clock at night, right? And we're hanging out and somebody says something. Oh, well, the girl says, I'm so grateful for you and mom, dad. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that I got you in my life. And, you know, me thinking I'm on the other side of this issue right? Unresolved issues having babies, right? I think I'm on the other side of this issue. I think I've, I've arrived to a complete acceptance to this issue. I come out of the kitchen and make a statement like, well, if, if Mark would have had his way, <laughs> you would be here with Mark and her right now. It wouldn't be me. So, you know, I'm making a statement what I perceive to be in jest. So I go back in the kitchen and my wife makes a comment of, well, if my husband only knew Mark asked me to meet him the night before we got married because he needed to talk to me. So, you know, I did a U-turn in the kitchen. I came out. I said, girl, I already knew that. I already knew that. And I did know that. I was told that. But there was some other stuff that I was told at my wedding reception that I never shared with anybody because I thought it was immature and insignificant stuff in my life. At my wedding reception, I was also told that this same gentleman told my wife, I'm going to wait a year because you two ain't going to make it anyway. And then I was also told that like three weeks later by a family member that he told my wife that, you know, if she didn't want to marry me, that he would run away with her. Now I'm talking about a joker that was at my wedding kissing me and telling me how happy he was that I was getting married. So I'm talking about what I want to do is now I want to go in this joker's mouth. It's 15 years later. She's been with me. Listen, I'm telling you something now. Unresolved issues. If you don't get to the exact nature of stuff, it's going to come back and it might destroy what you worked for. So it's 15 years later. This joker's a cop in Jersey City, but I'm going to Jersey City because I'm going in his mouth. 
And I'm going in his mouth and I'm telling him about it and I'm telling my in-laws about it and I'm telling her family about it. I'm telling everybody about it because this joker disrespected me. But now I want to talk about where the insecurities really kicked in. Because when I asked my wife about it, you know what she said? Oh boy, that stuff's silly. I said, babe, I'm sharing my feelings with you. She said, your, sil- your, your feelings are just, they're just, they're just stupid. <laughs> You know, you're talking to me now. <laughs> Y'all might have an image of who you think I am, but I'm a little sensitive, don't want my feelings hurt punk. <laughs> Baby, what you, what you mean it's stupid? <laughs> you know, I'm going to go in his mouth. Then we were supposed to go to a party. She's like, Baby, we're going to go to that party. No, I ain't going to that party because I'm going in his mouth. <laughs> Baby, it was 15 years ago. I didn't meet him. It don't matter. <laughs> now I'm on her. You ain't meet him because you knew if you would have met him, you wouldn't have shown up for the wedding. And you know if you would have met him, you wouldn't have shown up for the wedding because you really want to be married to me because you really don't care about me because you really care about him. Now I'm on a pity pop. But I want to share something with you. Since that situation happened, because God will always bring to the surface what needs to be brought to the surface. Since that situation has happened, my wife and my relationship has been the best it has ever been. Because I'm going to share with you that every time my wife said no, my first thought was because she wants to be with that joker. Every time she said, babe, I don't feel like it, that's because you want to be with him. You don't really want to be with me. My answer to her was you only with me because we got kids together. That's the only reason you really with me, because you just, you know, you committed to the kids and you really just won't be with me, but you really won't be with that joker. The only reason you with me is because of the kids. So every time you don't want to make love to me, it's because you really won't be with him. <laughs> Y'all are laughing, but that's a painful spot. That's a painful spot when you get to a spot where you can't go to a meeting and talk about that stuff because you've allowed people to put you in a position in which you really don't belong. I'm talking about that's a tight spot because you be at the podium always talking about how strong your marriage is because you have yet to tap into the real exact nature of what's really going on. So you at the podium talking about how wonderful your marriage is when you're locked up and you don't have the freedom to be who you want to be in your marriage because you refuse to deal with the exact nature of your insecurities because you really still, after a myriad of time, working 12 steps, having a relationship with God, really, 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 really deep down inside, you still hate yourself. So I'm talking about the struggle. People think this is so glorious up here. They bring you places. They pay for the room. They help you travel. You've been all over the world on NA. But if you're not, honest with yourself and telling the truth to yourself, you can come up here and perpetrate the fraud all you want while back at the ranch you're destroying everything through false pride and ego. So I'm talking about being trapped, locked up. Can't get out. Can't get out. I can't get out. I can't tell my sponsor because I'm ashamed that with 12 years clean, I'm in the spot that I'm in. I can't tell the men I sponsor because I don't want them to know that that's an area in which I'm still struggling some 12 years later. I can't go to means and talk about it because people don't love you where they at. They want to kick your back in because they talk about you all over the country. Sham boy, you should have been there already. Show me in the literature where it says I should have been there already. You know, we put people on a spot they don't belong. Recovery and sailness are rates. We, we recover at different rates up in this camp. My marriage, my wife and my marriage has been better than it's ever been in the last seven, eight months. We've talked more in the last seven or eight months. I'm going to talk about some of the other struggles, insecurities. Wednesday night's family night, me and my daughters, right? It's family night. My wife goes out, it's me and the girls. We watch my wife and kids. I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> Damon Wayne's takes his shirt off. My oldest daughter says, Woo wee, daddy. <laughs> 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 
Look at him. I said, look at who? She said, Damon, he cut up like that. Said, yeah. Come out the bathroom the next night, she go, Dad, you're getting a little heavy. <laughs> Three days later, my wife comes home, she says, hey, babe, you know, Bob from the dance school is working out. You gotta see how big his arms are. <laughs> So, you know, I lay in the cut for about three days. Now I'm online at Bally's. Now I'm in Bally's, right? I go to Bally's, I sign up. Now I'm at, the, now I'm at GNC. Now I'm at GNC, I'm buying all this whey protein. I'm buying creatine. I'm at the gym and I'm working out, I'm working out. I'm going at it, I'm coming home every day, I'm taking my shirt off. I'm saying to my daughter, yeah, baby, what's up? How you doing? Nobody's saying nothing. I'm like, God, dog, I know I'm getting, come on. Y'all don't recognize. Somebody help me here. <laughs> so now I'm dealing with my insecurities through the gym, trying to work out, get my body in shape because my wife thinks Bob got big arms. My oldest daughter thinks Damon looks tight. Now I'm starting to get big arms and look tight. Ain't nobody saying nothing to me. I'm talking about, come on now. Babe, you don't think? How I look, babe? One day I hear her say to Ashley, oh no, she said to my brother-in-law, because he's at the gym working out with me, she, and she's always arguing, she said, she said, boy, you ain't got nothing. Look, look at my husband got the V in the back. I was like, that's right. <laughs> but see how the disease attacks? But see, if you're in the proper position, you understand that that's a message from God. Because the message from God was, I'm getting older. I do construction, so I need to be in some sort of shape. I don't need to be muscle beach big. I need to be cut up a little bit, get myself in shape, get my cardiovascular in shape so that I can be in position to do what I do for a living and at 55, 60 years old when I still have to work to pay for college and weddings for my daughters, I have the ability to do so and they don't lay me off because they think I'm some old man who slowed down because he's out of shape. So see, if you're in the right position and you're always looking for God's blessing in situations that come into your life, you will get to see that God had my wife and my daughter say those things because he needed to motivate me to get myself in shape so I could be a better man. So I'm talking about being in position. Like an outfielder, you can't catch the ball unless you're in position. You can't catch God's blessings unless you're in position. And you gotta be in position to catch God's blessings. Otherwise it's going over your head or it's gonna go right past you, you ain't gonna even know it. You're gonna be talking about, I don't get nothing. I've been here 12 years, God ain't done nothing for me. You're now behind and used, he done a lot. So I'm talking about where the disease attacks. Where the disease attacks. And I'm gonna share this, I don't even know how much time I got left, but I'm gonna share this and I'm gonna shut up. <coughs> My wife and her family have always been real tight. And recently she's had some problems with her mom. And I'll tell you, it's been a struggle for me because I always had issues with her mom. We always, we always fought. I always felt like I didn't measure up. Some things have happened over the years. I wanna talk about how great God is because my wife has had the ability to come to me the last seven or eight weeks and talk to me about it. And I have never once said to her, I told you. I told you, I told you, if you, I told, cause you know what I want, I wanna tell her. Girl, I've been telling you for 10 years that's how your mom is. You've always been on your mom's side. But she's sitting, I've never told her that. I, I just hold her at night and I just tell her I love her and her mom's going through something and it'll be all right on the other side. 
And what that's done is that it's allowed us to grow closer because now she understands that I don't judge her. I don't dislike her family. My thing is that my family resides in Carteret, New Jersey, and it's my wife and my two daughters. What my folks do and her folks do and everybody else does is of no, nothing, it means nothing to me. And I don't want you to misunderstand me. I love them all, but it means nothing to me. My priority in life is my wife and my two daughters. I care nothing about anybody else and what they do. They are my only concern. I don't worry about that stuff. My folks had their shot. My in-laws had their shot. It's our shot to raise our kids. And I'm talking about being able to be there for my wife because it's been a struggle for my, my wife don't talk. My, she's not like me. <laughs> you ain't getting no feelings out of her. She ain't crying. She's, you know, she got that Sicilian German blood and she just ain't letting it out. And I don't say that to, to kick her back in. My wife is just a strong woman and she don't believe in that. But she's never trusted me because all of our relationship, I've always thrown stuff in her face. And I'm at a point in my life now that I just accept her folks where they are. And I love my wife. Whether or not her folks or my folks or anybody else talks to her. So that might not mean nothing to you, but that means a lot to me. To be able to lay in that bed and hold her and caress her and not be trying to maul her and make love to her, just hold her and cuddle with her and say, babe, I understand. I don't know what's up with your mom. I love you. And if you need to talk, I got you. Mm. Right. See, that's what recovery's about for me. That's what life's about for me. I mean, my two little girls, man, I love them to death. The little one's got a broken arm. We swear that there's a little boy trying to get out. <laughs> Split her lip last year, seven stitches. This year, it's the growth plate in her right arm. But my two little girls dance, and, and they're both very talented. And I work a lot, and I travel a lot, and my wife does most things with them, with dance school, because she's just more available than I am. And we were at a dance competition last year, and my oldest daughter is very talented. And she was up on the stage, and I was watching her, and she was watching this girl in front of her, and she was missing all her steps. Now the teacher's yelling at her, my wife's yelling at her, you know that dance, why are you missing up on that dance? You know that dance. And she came down to me, and her eyes were filled up, and I said, baby, do you know the dance? She said, yes, daddy, I don't need, yes. Then why are you watching Sarah? She says, because I get really nervous. And I says to her, listen to me, you know the steps, just go do them. I said, and right before you go out there, just say, God help me. And she went up on the stage, and she came down, and so typically, she runs right to my wife. She came down off the stage. It's just the truth. She came down off the stage and she ran right over to me and she jumped on my lap and she said, Daddy, it worked, it worked, it worked. See, because if you don't direct your kids to God, where are you directing them? And I was in uh, Springfield, Illinois a couple weeks ago and they had their uh, they got their list of what dance competition teams they made. And uh, she called me up, my oldest called me up, and she said, Daddy, I, I made ballet, and I made tap, and I made jazz, and I made lyrical, and I made this, and I made that, and you know, all the teams. And I said, oh, good, baby, I'm so proud of you. She says, but most importantly, I made hip hop for you. All my life, I just wanted to be a good husband and a father. I just wanted my kids, I just wanted the unconditional love and respect that kids give. And I've got that from both my daughters. My little one is, she's just off the chain. She's a little thug. She's just like her father. Yeah, she's just like her father. She's a little thug, she into hip hop. And... But every day when I come home from work, she's at my car. She's at the door and she's waiting for me to open it so she can kiss me. And then she just ignores me the rest of the day. <laughs> but you know what? That five minutes that I get with her, when she comes out to take my phone and my lunchbox, is worth a million dollars. And when my parents came in the house, we ran. So we're breaking the chain. We're breaking the chain. I wanna, I wanna thank uh, Greater Los Angeles for the invitation. Thank you. I want to thank you for the love and the respect. I mean, really, y'all, you guys have no idea. I mean, I know you guys know I'm friends with yo Steve and Chris and Weto and, and Randy and, and Guy and the rest of them. I, I, but you know what? The love that I was shown. I mean, 
I was fortunate enough to do the men's breakfast last year, and I had men coming to me this weekend and thanking me for last year. You know what, man? Thank you. Thank you for the love. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for accepting me right where I'm at. Because, yeah, I, I share a lot. Big deal. Big deal. How am I living? How you really living? Go talk to my wife. I don't need to be around. Ask her the questions. She'll tell you how. Ask my kids how I'm living. That's what you need to ask. Don't ask me or the men I sponsor, because they're a little corrupt. <laughs> you know, just that, you know, just how am I living? And I believe I live a spiritual life based in principles. I, live, I, I believe I live a life based in God. If anything I said this morning touched your spirit, remember we invited God in. So when I close, don't clap for me. Clap because God woke you up. He answered your prayers. And he's always had you and he will always have you. And remember that God loves you and he needs you. You're a special instrument in his life, in his plan. Every addict in here is a special instrument. From Bob B to the youngest addict. It's a special instrument of God. So remember that uh, if nobody told you today that they love you, remember Jimmy T does, and thank you for letting me share.